Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the kind introduction. Uh, as announced in the drafts for this meeting, um, this paper departs from the premise that the liturgical arrangement of the church interior is possibly the most specific and intrinsic characteristic of the physical organism that we call a church. After all, liturgy may be considered to be the most intense field of encounter between architectural space and religious activity in a church building. As an art historian in traditional studies on the Italian Renaissance, I have often been struck by the entirely secular interpretative framework for explaining buildings with a distinct religious function. Not surprisingly, the desire to detect and explain ancient, generally pagan, features prevails. My today's attempt to investigate just the religious aspect of church building in Renaissance Italy will be focused on the liturgical appointments in existing and newly built churches of the period. Necessarily, this exercise will have to concentrate on a few cases in order to be fruitful for a comparative uh, approach, the selected cases will have to be diverse in time, place, and patronage, function, and context. In the planned publication, I intend to examine some five or six examples in central and northern Italy. But in this brief paper, I will discuss only three, hoping that even this small selection will yield some relevant insights. Pienza. The small city of Pienza has with good reason been described as an ideal urban creation of the early Renaissance, a real showpiece of humanist architecture. This well-known project of one of the most prominent personalities of the early Renaissance in Italy, Pope Pius II, has been studied intensely. Actually, art historians are extremely happy when they encounter well-preserved physical remains that can be connected to an extensive written text in which the patron accounts for his commission. Enea Silvio Piccolomini's commentari indeed allow not only an intimate look into the individual considerations of his patronage, but also in his religious disposition. The central position of the church in the new city must have been a conscious statement of its significance in the urban design. It is true that this location was predetermined by the modest parish church of Pius' birthplace, Corsignano. But other decisions would have been possible. It is also true that the new church is exceeded by the adjacent papal palace. Palace Church. in surface and in mass. This urbanistic and architectural interplay between sacred and profane, with a tendency of profane dominus, dominance, is a characteristic of the Renaissance. A couple of dec decades later, we witness in Rome an important church being absorbed into the newly built papal Cancelleria Palace, or better, the church of San Lorenzo in Damaso is virtually swallowed down by it. The church is in this wing of the palace, you may know it, and this is the entrance of the church. In that perspective, the balance in Pienza is different. The church is the unmistakable urban center, and its bell tower is the highest point of the cityscape. Nevertheless, Pius' chapter on the palace in his commentaries is longer than that on the cathedral. Seen from afar, both buildings are, I would say, complementary, landmarks of Pius' program. The church was intended, as Pius tells us, to become the cathedral of the newly created Diocese of Pienza. He also mentions that its shape of a three-aisled hall church was inspired by churches Enea himself had seen in Austria. A lower church underneath, the southern half of the upper church, compensated for the sloping ground. 
Architectural historians agree that the result is not a bunch of citations of existing buildings, nor a product of transition between Gothic and Renaissance, but a highly sophisticated creation that is obviously the result of consultations between the papal patron and the Florentine architect Bernardo um, um, Rossellino. And I quote here uh, Mauro Mussolini, who is present here, I'm very happy with that, as an authority who underlined the uniqueness of this creation. There is no time nor reason to discuss the details of the cathedral architecture here. Um, I will instead f focus briefly on the main features of its spatial and liturgical disposition. Pius explains the unusual axis of his church from north to south as to be determined by necessity. That's a quotation, by necessity. Indeed, excavations have demonstrated that the demolished parish church on the site stood on the traditional east-west axis. In black, the or original parish church directed to the east, and this in gray is the new church directed to the south. The urbanistic reasons to locate the cathedral and the Palazzo Comunale face to face and to build the entranceless altar side of a church above the steep hillside can be easily understood. Many Renaissance architect, architects did not hesitate to situate churches according to considerations of urbanistic advantage, I would say, and to ignore brazenly old traditions of sacred direction. Pius at least feels obliged to give an account of this deviation of tradition. That's something. But he also betrays another reason. The desire to create an interior full of light. I quote, a sea of light. The central axis was directed toward the strongest moment of uh, light during daytime, obviously fitting this concept. Pius must have been familiar with the symbolic interpretations of light in the sacred space in Christian literature. For example, those written by the early Christian poet Prudentius and the medieval author Sujet of Saint-Denis. He himself had been the titular priest of, an, of the early Christian basilica of Santa Sabina in Rome as a cardinal from 1456 uh, until his election to the papacy in 58. Santa Sabina was one of the most light-flooded late antique churches with a considered symbolical stage setting of the light referring to divine presence. Pius had huge windows in his Pienza Cathedral, deliberately not filled with colored stained glass, but instead with what he calls crystal glass, accepting the disadvantage of strong backlighting in the vista from the nave to the presbytery. He describes the whole church poetically as a house of glass. The second characteristic feature is the altar disposition. Pius provides for a high altar, one altar in each of both chapels that flank the central chapel, and additionally the choir stalls and the bishop's seat in the central chapel and a sacrament's tabernacle in the southwestern chapel. You see it indicated here on this ground plan from around uh, 1700 AD. He adds uh, that in the lower church, two other altars were provided to serve the people, so obviously lay altars. This differentiated cluster of altars was nothing unusual. Unusual was their modest number and their programmatic fixation. Pius did not allow any altar to be added in the future. Obviously, he wanted to limit the excesses of spontaneous altar um, foundations. And for the rest, the same was true for burials, explicitly forbidden by Pius except for bishops' burials in the church. One may suspect that aesthetic reasons, as well as the intention to maintain an exclusive dynastic piccolomini character for the cathedral, 
were the underlying motives for this remarkable enactment of enduring control. The four side altars were all provided with altarpieces painted by various renowned Chinese artists with traditional iconographies on the modern medium of the Florentine Tavola Quadrata. More extraordinarily was the disposition of the high altar, carefully described by the patron. It was freestanding between the two last pillars here, on a platform of four steps, the priest and other officiating clergy were standing with the back towards the people and the people in the nave and facing the choir singers in the central chapel. It's directly written in this way by Pius. Pius High Altar is a conscious departure from the standard disposition in contemporary Italy. He refrains from an altarpiece and maintains an open vista from the nave and from the altar itself into the central chapel and its dominating window. The Pope may hark back to the early Christian altar dispositions still existing in the papal basilicas of Rome. Moreover, he may have wanted to emphasize a continuous axis from the entrance to the main source of light in the interior, a notion with early Christian roots as well. Finally, the cathedra in the center of the apse, or chevet, was likewise a clear early Christian device, distinct from the usual medieval position of the cathedra at the gospel side of the altar. And we see the cathedra here before the restorations of the 30s of the last century with a canopy. Now the canopy disappeared. It's here. <clears throat> Connected to this intended open vista of the central liturgical elements is the spatial idea of openness that Pius emphasizes in his description. When you enter the central door, you can behold the entire church with its chapels and altars, and you will be impressed by the clarity of the light and the splendor of the architecture." End of quote. This same ideal seems to have prompted Pius to clear the central nave of St. Peter's in Rome from alleged obstacles like chancel screens and funeral monuments in 1462 that is at the eve of the arrival of St. Andrew's relic, the head of St. Andrew's, uh, when it was expected in the basilica. Most probably the high altar in Pienza was destined for pontifical celebrations and the daily cathedral liturgy by the canons, the cathedra for the bishop and the visiting pope, the choir stalls for the daily office of the cathedral chapter and their singers, the side altars for votive masses, and the altars in the lower church as so-called lay altars for the people. There in the lower church was also the baptismal font, symbol of the parochial function of the cathedral. The placing of the sacraments tabernacle nacle, in the side chapel, well visible and accessible from the public part of the church, was a relative novelty, breaking the Italian tradition of keeping the sacrament in the sacristy, as was usual in the Middle Ages. Thus, Pius established a well-organized system of worship in the cathedral with a fitting and highly functional ensemble of liturgical appointments. A major part of it is well preserved until the present day. His project is clearly inspired by a liturgical concept that may have been subordinate to his major aim of creating a lasting memory for himself and his impoverished noble family, but not less considered. An emphasis on the Eucharist and the sacrament, a concentration on the ritual essentials, and a certain amount of iconographical reduction seem to have been the leading points. In its relative originality, this project may be viewed as a genuine expression of pious faith, with its rational and commonsensical characteristics, as it shines through in his writings. He himself qualifies the cathedral as signum aliquot pietatis nostrae, 
And certainly he saw it as a truly Christian counterpart of the despised Sigismondo Malatesta, the criminal ruler as of Rimini, who in pious words, I quote, did build a splendid church at Rimini dedicated to St. Francis, but he filled it so full of pagan works of art that it seemed less a Christian sanctuary than a temple where heavens might worship the devil. End of quote. St. Peter's in Rome. My brief discussion of the early planning history of St. Peter's will limit itself only to one short episode, which may function as a hinge in this brief talk. It is the famous dispute between the architect Donato Bramante, entrusted with the commission to develop designs for a complete renewal or rebuilding of the Constantinian Basilica, and Pope Julius II, the patron who would lay the foundation stone in 1506, that is one year after this dispute. We know of this consultation between architect and patron thanks to Giles of Viterbo, the eminent humanist and reformer who acted as Julius' as advisor and probably was present at the meeting. Giles reports the arguments. Bramante presents a draft of his design of the new church, maybe this one, but this is not sure, um, and proposes to change the alignment of the basilica and to face the front and entrances toward the ancient obelisk at the south side in which Julius Caesar's ashes were believed to have been preserved. And the obelisk is standing here. Since antiquity, because that was the, the spina of the ancient circus. The consequence was, the architect must have pointed out, to move the tomb of the apostle to an architecturally optimal position. The tomb was here, in front of the old apse. Julius declares immediately that he will never accept a translation of St. Peter's tomb under no condition. Bramante still tries to persuade the pontiff in drawing his attention to the magnificent impression the obelisk with its ancient namesake's ashes will make in front of the basilica's entrance. Julius replies that the apostle's tomb has always remained intact since the earliest popes and that he wants to maintain the existing orientation of the basilica. Bramante has to keep in mind that his commission was to build a church over a tomb and not to build a tomb into a church, at least the tomb of the apostle, because Julius, as we all know, wanted to have his tomb inserted in a new church. That was an important motive. The Pope is said to have concluded the discussion with declaring that the sacred has precedence over the profane and religion over magnificence. For Bramante, the obelisk was untouchable, whereas St. Peter's grave was not. A monument of pagan antiquity carried more weight than a sacred memorial from apostolic times. One suspects that he felt his greatest task hardly as a religious mission. It is striking that in only a minimal number of the numerous drafts and drawings in the design process of New St. Peter's, the architects have indicated the position of the altar or other liturgical fittings. In general, the architectural design process in Renaissance Italy seems to have been a rather abstract process vis-à-vis -vis the liturgical functions and needs of the buildings. And this is one of the exceptions in which Bramante indicates at least the position of the ancient high altar with the apostle's tomb and another altar that he seems to project there. Julius is put to the proof in his pride, his love, his love for antiquity, and his craving for magnificence. One may be astonished by his thoughtlessness concerning the commission to Bramante without clear conditions beforehand in respect of the inviolability uh, of the apostle's grave and the high altar. Yet, at the moment of a confrontation, the Pope persists in the primeval traditions of the sacred tomb 
the unity of tomb and papal altar, and the sacred erection of the basilica with the facade towards the east. The dispute seems symptomatic for the tension between pagan and Christian in the Italian Renaissance. Not only thanks to Erasmus, Julius has the reputation of a ruler obsessed by worldly concerns. But in his clash with the ambitious architect Bramante on questions of liturgy and traditional church symbolism, he is the unshakable defender of Christian religion, as he defines it himself. The last example brings us to northern Italy on the eve of the Council of Trent. The cathedral church of the proud city of Verona, with early Christian origins, but Romanesque and Gothic in its appearance, is renovated on behalf of Bishop, Bishop Gian Matteo Giberti, um, bishop in the 30s of the 16th century. Giberti is beloved among scholars of reform, not only for being a bishop taking his residence serious, but also for having, they claim, an open-minded, tolerant, and loving approach to episcopal reform. Adriano Prosperi concludes that Giberti's thorough and exemplary reform of his diocese was his well-considered contribution to the reform of the universal church. Part of his program was the renovation of the liturgical appointments in the cathedral. It is not necessary to discuss the renovation in detail. Moreover, in contrast to Pienza, we miss a great deal of documentation, also due to the loss of the archives in a fire, and the physical evidence in the cathedral is itself is less well studied. At any rate, the project encompassed the entire area of the high altar and the presbytery, which was completely repaved and its wall decorated with figural paintings. So this area of the church. The work started in 1527 and may have been completed in 1535. A number of features are remarkable in our context. The choir of the canons was removed from the nave side of the altar and new choir stalls were installed in the apse. We have already heard it in the paper of Sally that it was a usual form of renewal. This disposition was already realized in the newly built church in Pienza, but likewise in a growing number of monastic and collegiate churches in Italy, and we have seen that. In this sense, Giberti followed a trend. A completely new high altar was built. I'm not sure if exactly on the ancient position. It was freestanding and accessible at all its parts. On the center of the deep altar mensa, actually it was a dub double altar, like in, like in uh, Arezzo, a double altar. We see here the, the back in its, uh, the rear of it in its present situation. But originally there was a monumental tabernacle for the sacrament on the mensa, so here it disappeared afterwards, a so-called tempieto type, supported by angels that gave the transparency, uh, transparency necessary for the visual communication between the celebrant and people in the on the nave side of the altar and the canons behind the altar in the epistles. And that was a big difference, I think, with the Arezzo situation. This disposition of the tabernacle was the third stage in its general history from the sacristy in the Middle Ages to a lateral position in the presbytery or in a chapel, like in Pienza, in the 15th century, and then in the first decades of the 16th century, in an increasing degree, centrally on the high altar, a device that would become canonical after the Council of Trent. The most conspicuous and original addition was the pergola-like screen at the nave side of the presbytery, still standing here with the new, it, the new disposition from the last years here, and this is the pergola on the plan. It was designed by Michele San Micheli, a prominent military and civil architect. It is a semicircular screen, 
consisting of a high parapet on which 12 columns support an architrave. In the center, an archway gives axial access to the presbytery. All this is executed in fine marbles. And above the central archway arises a high crucifix with the statues of the two Marys. Marble candelabras corresponding with the columns stand on the rest of the curved architrave of this so-called tornacoro. Derek Moore, in a thorough study of this unique device, concludes that it was inspired by the supposed Constantinian pergola of old St. Peter's. I think he is right, even if that was not a semicircular one, of course. The pergola is also part of a concept of liturgical space that harks back to early Christian or alleged early Christian prototypes. The nave is free of obstacles. The sanctuary is screened off clearly and monumentally, but in a transparent way so that the high altar as focus of the church interior remains completely visible. Behind it, in the apse, are the seats for the bishop and the clergy, like in the preserved early Christian basilicas of Rome. A modern accent, finally, is the tabernacle of the sacrament in its central position on the altar, characteristic for a new type of devotion that links the preservation of the sacrament directly to the Eucharistic significance of the altar. Religious reformation is an expression of genuine religious consciousness. Giberti must have been inspired by authentic religious considerations in his new organization of the cathedral's interior. They had, by way of exception, nothing to do with self-representation. It's my impression, at least. The coats of arms exhibited on the Tornacoro are those of Giberti's friend and ally, Ludovico di Canossa, Bishop of Bayeux, who had provided for the funding of the renovation. Giberti planned his own burial rather anonymously at the feet of Canossa's monument in the presbytery. So there was not really a self-representation of Giberti in this, um, in this uh, presbytery. The mainspring of his undertaking was of another order than that of Pius and of Julius. As I said, I have used the dispute between Julius and Bramante on the importance of the aspect of religion in building a new church only as a hinge between the two shutters of this diptych. Therefore, I conclude with a few last remarks on the cases of Pienza and Verona. Both Piccolomini and Giberti realized liturgical dispositions that were innovative in the perspective of their time. In both cases, the visibility of the liturgical event, the central liturgical event at the high altar, and I would say the reduction of imagery and decoration of that very center were essential f issues. In both cases, the value of the Eucharist was emphasized by the visual and permanent presence of the Holy Sacrament, although in different spatial settings, Pienza and Verona. The inspiration of early Christian models is likewise noticeable in both arrangements. These features, in view of the originality of their employment and the personalities of their patrons, may be perceived as realizations of faith staged in a spatial setting. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>